Dear colleagues, a very good day to all of you. And welcome to this session uh, entitled Caring for All the Poor and Ethical Issues. My name is Harris uh, Didakis. Um, I am a family doctor by training, uh, and I'm joining you today from Brussels. Um, this session will be shared together uh, with uh, Henriette van der Host. Uh, she's um, a professor at Amsterdam University Medical Center, Professor of General Practice, Aging and Later Life and Mental Health, as well um, as uh, Andre Rosford. She is a general practitioner in a rural practice from Ireland and a director of uh, the Quality Improvement Program with the Irish College General Practitioners. Today, uh, we have two presentations. Um, the first presentation uh, will be carried out by uh, Carlos Martins and the same by Case Herto. Um, and before I introduce our first speaker, um, I would like just to remind all of you that there is um, a chat function inside this platform and you will be able to uh, send uh, questions to our speakers and we will address them after each one of the presentations. So, in the very first presentation, Carlos Martins will discuss quaternary prevention in care of the elderly and explore the risks of medical intervention causing more harm than benefits for the elderly and what kind of prevention makes sense in our elderly patients. Carlos is a family medicine specialist. He's a PhD in clinical and health services research and an assistant professor at the uh, Department of Community Medicine, Health Information and Decision Sciences of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Porto. He's a researcher at the Center of uh, uh, Health Technology and Services Research, a head and a physician in the Family Medicine Center in Porto. And of course, he is the chair of the European Network for Prevention and Health Promotion in Family Medicine and General Practice, Europref. As a final uh, remark, he's the a founder and webmaster and editor of uh, the web portal MG Familiar. I think I'm not pronouncing that correct, Carlos. Um, and founder and webmaster um, of the medical social network, Dr. Sir, uh, PT. Welcome, Carlos. The Thank you. Yours. Thank you very much, uh, Aris. Um, you pronounced it very, very well. Dear colleagues, good morning to you all. Uh, I'm going now to share my screen. Hope you are seeing my screen now. Okay, first I'd like to congratulate our Dutch colleagues and all the colleagues from uh, Wonka Europe Executive Board, from the other networks, everyone that worked in the organization of this great conference. And of course, thank you also for inviting me to be here today. I'm going to discuss some reasons that make elderly patients at high risk from, for, uh, of suffering harm from medical interventions. About the role of quaternary intervention in the care of our elderly patients. And I'm going to finish sharing some tools to navigate these troubled waters. Let me give you two real-world examples. Would you mind meeting Mateusz? Mateusz is 72 years old and helps his wife take care of their grandchildren. Most days, he takes his one-hour walking tour and usually swims twice a week. He loves to read a newspaper on the bench in the garden. He is a well-informed person. He is overweight. He is not much of taking medications as he has been healthy, but he takes one pill of aspirin, 100 milligram daily. He is taking aspirin for about four years. In one of those consultations, when he asked about taking aspirin, 
Mateus commented, they say that everyone should take it to prevent heart attacks and strokes. So, in this case, the clinical question that it's to be answered is, in a 72 years old, does taking 100 mg daily aspirin protect him from having a heart attack, stroke, or even more importantly, does it protect him from dying from all causes? This would be our structured PICO. And what do you think? Is this a well-built PICO or not? Okay, let's assume it is. It seems to be a good PICO. However, I am from a generation used to vinyl discs. And when a new single was launched, there were always two sides. Side A, usually with the best song, but there also was also the, the side B. Well, dear friends, in that video, side B was missing, and we often forget it in our daily practice. In the outcomes, we also have to consider possible harmful events and look at them with attention. To answer our PICO, our clinical question, here we have a randomized controlled trial. The so-called ASPRI trial. The results uh, were published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. It involved um, persons who were 70 years old uh, or older and did not have cardiovascular disease, dementia, or disability. Participants were randomly assigned to receive 100 milligrams aspirin or placebo. And here we have the results. After a immediate follow-up of 4.7 years, there were 1.6 more deaths per 1,000 person years among those receiving aspirin and those receiving placebo. I repeat, more deaths in the aspirin group. And cancer-related deaths account for much of this of the excess mortality. Here we have it. As you may see in picture A, uh, there were a much more deaths related to cancer in the aspirin group, and it, uh, this was not observed in other causes of that. So, surprisingly, unexpectedly, the aspirin trials shows us a uh, higher all-cause mortality risk among apparently healthy older adults taking daily aspirin and may be mainly attributed to cancer. Now, think about the real world. How many patients do we have as metos? How many elderly patients without previous cardiovascular disease taking aspirin? In this kind of situation, we are doing more harm than good. In this kind of situation, we need to implement quaternary prevention. Another case, please meet Filomena. Filomena is a grandmother of two, and she loves to take care of her grandchildren and to walk. Almost every day, she walks more than 60 minutes to and from her daughter's house. She is 76 years old. She has been healthy. She has well-controlled hypertension with amlipine 5 mg a day. And last summer, she made a routine blood test. And when she went to her family health unit, she had to be seen by another physician because her own family doctor was on vacation. This colleague medicated the patient with rosuvastatin 10 mg. After six months, Filomena seeks help from her family doctor because she has a lot of pain in the legs. She is uh, applying topic diclofenac, but it has not improved. And she is even facing difficulty maintaining her walks. Uh, she already had to ask her daughter to pick her up by car. There is no evidence of edema on the feet, no infections or other inflammatory signs. 
And by reading the health record, the family doctor sees that the patient's LDL cholesterol has been 164 in the summer. And it was based on this value that the colleague initiated rosuvastatin. The doctor chooses to suspend rosuvastatin and repeat the lipid profile after two months. Those two months passed and the patient returned to the consultation. She no longer has pain. She went back to her daily walks and she brings the new blood test results. The LDL value is now 156. In this case, the PICO, our clinical question is this. In a 76-year-old woman, the lowering LDL cholesterol with rosuvastatin 10 milligrams protect her from having a major cardiovascular event, or even more importantly, does it protect her from dying from all causes? And of course, don't forget the side B, this without causing harm. This seems to be a good pico. So let's look to some evidence. Here we have a systematic review that seems to answer our question. It was recently published in The Lancet. The aim was to summarize the evidence of LDL cholesterol lowering therapies in older patients. And according to the authors, the interpretation of the result is in patients aged 75 years and older, lipid lowering was as effective in reducing cardiovascular events as it was in patients younger than 75 years old. At first glance, these conclusions seem okay. But do we have a problem or not? Yes, we have a problem. It is not the same thing for a patient with a previous stroke or heart attack to take a statin or other lipids lowering medication to prevent new major events or death or a patient without a previous stroke or heart attack. This is what our cardiology colleagues usually call to load the lipids in primary prevention versus secondary prevention. And uh, by the way, each time they state this, we from family medicine should correct them because taking a statin after having a stroke to prevent another stroke is not secondary prevention. This is tertiary prevention. And the problem with this meta-analysis is that the authors shift their conclusion by mixing trials implemented in primary prevention with those in tertiary prevention, as you may see in this picture from the Lancer paper. Um, for example, Utopia is a primary prevention uh, uh, trial and Odyssey or Fourier are tertiary prevention trials. This is indeed a strange thing and becomes even stranger because if we dig in and look carefully at the supplemental file that is, it is uh, published with the main paper in the Lancet, we may find these different meta-analyses with the separation of the trials that included patients with established uh, cardiovascular disease, and you may see there is a beneficial effect from lipid lowering. And then in the lower part of the table, you may see trials that included patients without cardiovascular disease, and there is not the positive effect of the treatment. I repeat, no benefit in elderly patients without cardiovascular disease. Now, applying this evidence to our patient Philomena, think about this. Before the treatment, Philomena was a healthy person. After the treatment, she became a sick person with bad quality of life, and this with a lipid-lowering therapy without evidence of protecting her. 
I believe these two cases are two very practical examples of how things may become tricky when making decisions about the health of our elderly parents. It's easy to do more harm than good to our elderly patients. And this is why it's never too late for quaternary prevention in the care of the elderly. The way our other colleagues from uh, Europrev and I see it, quaternary prevention is the set of actions uh, to protect persons from medical interventions that are likely to cause more harm than good. Mark Chamu uh, first proposed the concept of quaternary prevention. In 2014, John Broderson, Liza Schwartz, Stephen Wolosh proposed an improvement of the concept. And after some discussions in Europrep Network, we published this paper in the European Journal of General Practice. In contemporary medicine, human beings may suffer harm from medical interventions from conception, during their childhood, during their entire healthy lifetime, and during a self-limited disease, a chronic disease, or a terminal disease. This means whichever quadrant, quaternary prevention should be present in physicians' minds for every intervention they suggest to a patient. Elderly patients are a particularly vulnerable group to medical harm. Here we have some factors that contribute to this vulnerability. First, the heterogeneity in health status is much more significant in this age group. And also in terms of human body physiology, hepatic and renal metabolism. This makes the elderly more susceptible to medications adverse reactions. In many health topics, patients from this age group are not included in the randomized controlled trials. So we have to extrapolate evidence obtained from other age groups. And this extrapolation has risks and often originates medical harm. In this age group, comorbidities are very frequent. Patients often get multiple medications with an increased risk of suffering from medication interactions. Another problem that we have in this field is that guidelines are single disease oriented. We have a guideline to treat hypertension, uh, another to treat diabetes, another to treat COPD, but we don't have a guideline to treat the person that has at the same time hypertension, diabetes, and COPD. And it's not the same thing to treat someone who only has one disease or to treat someone who has that disease and at the same time two more conditions. By the way, I found this exciting, exciting paper written by our colleagues from Singapore developed a treatment plan for a, a hypothetical 72-year-old woman with asthma, depression, diabetes, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. And this, this treatment plan, according to the latest clinical practice guidelines recommendations. And then they assess the treatment burden by quantifying it in terms of time spent, cost, and number of appointments and medications. Here are the results. When six clinical practice guidelines are cumulatively and strictly followed, an average of about two hours was spent daily taking 14 different medications with a relevant amount of patients' out-of-pocket payment. Of course, the treatment burden was time-consuming, costly, and disruptive. Now, to a frequent doubt that we face regarding prevention in this age group, when to stop cancer screening in this age group? The main rule here is do not recommend cancer screening in patients with a life expectancy of less than 10 years. However, I recognize 
that sometimes it may be challenging to decide. And But in this field, another relevant question that we may uh, put to ourselves is what do we want to prevent? Cancer screenings are mainly to prevent death. In, in the elderly, death is something unavoidable. So our main focus in prevention in this age group should be to prevent disability. Quality of life becomes even more important than quantity of life in this age group. I want to finish my presentation with some good news. Some tools may help us to implement quaternary prevention, which may help us to navigate in these troubled waters. For example, some medication databases, software, and even mobile apps may be precious tools in managing and helping polymedicated patients. Here is a tool that may be very useful and it's free, the Medscape Drug Reference. It's available on the web or as a mobile app. As you may see in this picture, we just have to insert all medication our patient is doing and the app automatically gives us detailed information about the possible interactions, including some hints on how to manage these interactions. Medstopper. Medstopper is also a very useful tool. It's also free. The internet link is in the corner, medstop.com. Our Canadian colleague, James McCormack, developed this tool and it helps us prescribe medications more safely and also to uh, safely deprescribe unnecessary or harmful medications. It incorporates the famous uh, stop and BS criteria. Finally, a word for choosing wisely. Choosing wisely campaign keeps spreading in many countries of the world and as a set of recommendations that help us avoid harm to our patients. Dear colleagues, I tried to show you how we have to be aware of not harming our patients from the moment we look at the evidence to the moment we share decisions with our patients. For that, I believe there are some good tools available, but don't forget, the patient himself is still the best tool. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all a very happy conference. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for, us for this uplifting and uh, thought-provoking presentation to start our day on this, this Friday at the conference. Uh, we've had some comments on the chat saying very interesting studies, and you presented some wonderful studies there to, to back up your statements. Uh, to the participants, you Please feel free to, to submit some questions. We have another few minutes of possibility, potential possibility to ask Carlos questions. So perhaps um, I will start by making a comment and uh, you have so many thought-provoking comments. Uh, you said, Carlos, it's easy to do more harm than good in our elderly patients. Would you like to just say a little bit more about about that, easier to do more harm. Okay, um, we, we, for example, in elderly patients, as I said, comorbidities are very frequent. And uh, we, we know that uh, sometimes a patient doing only one uh, treatment, one kind of medication, already uh, may suffer adverse reactions or adverse effects. But we are aware that when we increase the number of medications that the patient takes at the same time, um, these risks increases a lot. And if we add a death factor, it is true, for example, for a normal healthy adult. If we think that an in elderly patients, very frequently, they have some limitations in renal function, 
in hepatic metabolism, this risk of uh, uh, having uh, interactions, medication interactions, of having side effects, of a having uh, um, side effects that bring harm to their own quality of life. For example, it's very often a medicated uh, older person to complain from dry mouth. Dry mouth is one of the most frequent symptoms of uh, uh, drug medication in, in polymedicated patients. So it's really indeed very easy. Even if we, sometimes we may have in good intention of not polymedicating our patient, uh, of avoiding to, to avoid to give him uh, more than, for example, five different medications. We may have that uh, intention, but you know, if a patient has uh, uh, diabetes type 2 for more than 15 or, or 20 years, it's probably, he probably needs already three different medications. If yes. at the same time he has hypertension for more than 10 years, he probably needs two. He's already making five. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. So it is very easy, very easy to get yes. into that slippery slope. Yes, Carlos. Yes. We have a, a, a question in, and when questions are submitted, you may click on the top right if you agree with that question. So the most popular question at the moment, Carlos, is it's about cancer screening and your comment about uh, the uh, perhaps the appropriate age cutoff for introducing that concept. And the question is, do you agree with a cutoff age of 74 in this country okay. uh, for mammography and for occult blood in stool or colonoscopy as a general rule? Okay. I, I thank you very much for this question because it's really a, a hot topic. We have to differentiate uh, in, when we talk about uh, cancer screening in these patients, we have, first of all, to differentiate from um, mass screening programs that are population-based from individual uh, screening uh, uh, decisions between the patient and his own family doctor. Uh, what we may call sometimes it's called in the literature as an opportunistic screening or case finding screening. Um, we have to think that um, mass population based screening programs are oriented uh, to a population, so it's more inter are more interventions from a public health perspective, where an entire set of population persons between some age groups are invited to undergo periodically to a screening. So this is the main reason why uh, we have in the recommendations uh, usually a fixed age group uh, to do uh, a certain uh, screening. So for example, in some countries, we have breast cancer screening uh, where uh, under this population-based screening programs, women are invited to undergo a mammography in a two-year interval from 50 years old until they are, for example, 74 years old. Yes. And for, for a patient that has been always very right <laughs> and adhered always to the screening, Sometimes it feels difficult when she becomes 75 years old or 76 years old. And well, no, I am not invited to the screening. <laughs> have, have, have I, what happened? <laughs> have I, uh, uh, am, uh, don't I count for the society anymore? <laughs> so yes. some... speaking, of, speaking, speaking of the society, uh, thank you. We've 30 seconds to answer one more question, and it's from Eric Baum in Germany. And it is about the Europrev Society, the Europrev Network. And it's, how can we make GPs more aware of Europrev activities 
of which you're the chair, instead of the European Society of Cardiology recommendations, which are highly flawed by influence of the pharmaceutical industry. So you've 20 seconds. Carlos. 20 seconds. Okay. Visit our, our uh, your pref uh, website and contact your uh, countries, colleges, and ask them to be your college delegates to your pref. We are needing urgently working force. So this would be the answer for Eka Baum and a quick answer for the previous questions, if I agree or not. Um, after this age, for example, after 74 age, we have to consider the individual characteristics of the patients. So we have to consider, for example, the life expectancy, the health status, and make a shared decision to do or not to do the screening after this age. Thank you so much, Carlos. Manage it. <laughs> yes, you did. Over to you, Hans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for you this wonderful presentation. It's my pleasure. And thank you very much, Andre, for uh, moderating the discussion. So, uh, we explored a quaternary prevention in this wonderful presentation. And we will now dig into care consistent with values, goals, and the preferences of the older patients. Our second keynote of this morning um, we, um, uh, it will be delivered by uh, Professor Case Hertog, who will discuss ethical dilemmas in the care of older people and explore issues such as advanced directives and advanced care planning, including in the context of dementia in our patients. This is a professor of medicine for older people and care ethics at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. He is head of the Department of Medicine for Older People and chairs University Network of Organizations for Elderly Care, um, a network of 24 long-term care organizations affiliated with the Amsterdam University Medical Center. His research focuses on quality of care in the final years of life with a focus on person-centered care, end-of-life decision-making, and ethical issues. Before I hand the floor to you, Case, I'd like to remind you all of you to uh, write down the questions in the chat function, uh, and Henrik will moderate the last part of the conversation after the presentation. Case, your, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, introduction and thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to present on this wonderful Congress. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, I hope uh, I intend to share with you some thoughts on the challenges and dilemmas of planning ahead with people suffering from dementia and decision-making disability. This is my disclosure slide. Um, I will discuss the following topics. First, I will briefly touch upon some pros and cons of receiving an early diagnosis in dementia. I will then uh, address the background and limitations of the most frequently used instrument for planning ahead, namely the advanced directive or living will. And next, I will go into the crucial issue of reference adaptation in dementia and address the implications thereof for advanced care planning. And by way of conclusion, I will end with five topics for reflection and discussion. Dementia. Why do we need or do we not need an early diagnosis? I think, first of all, the stigma associated with dementia may prevent people from seeking an early diagnosis. And from an ethical perspective, Receiving an early diagnosis could affect autonomy, privacy, and social participation, for example, in relation to financial, uh, in relation to financial transactions, driving a car, or even holding a driver's license. Also, the absence of these modifying treatments withholds patients and healthcare professionals, perhaps as well, from seeking early diagnosis. On the other hand, on the positive side, patients may benefit from receiving an early diagnosis because it provides an explanation for observed symptoms and behavioral, ch uh, behavioral change, and it may put an end to their suspicions. And in addition, they can obtain access to treatments focused on risk reduction and 
to actually prevent it. But on top of this, one of the most relevant benefits of diagnosing the disease early, according to efforts of early diagnosis, is that it allows the individual and the dear ones to plan ahead while they still have the capacity to do so, and to make their wishes regarding future care and treatment clear to their family and healthcare providers. However, Research indicates that only a minority of new diagnosed patients initiates such planning, while the majority tends to live by day and abstains from looking ahead. Some explicitly indicate that they need time to think things over and to let the message sink in. However, the tragedy of dementia is that the window of opportunity for planning seems limited because with disease progression, the dementia sufferer will soon become trapped in a situation of mental incapacity. In view of this grand perspective, and in order to spare themselves an end of life with dementia, older people frequently resort to the drafting of an advanced directive containing the wishes and instructions for future care and treatment, and frequently combined with the appointment of healthcare proxy. These advanced directives are viewed by many as the optimal instrument for patients to retain control in healthcare situations after they have lost decisional capacity. And therefore, in many jurisdictions, advanced directives have received a formal legal status and are more or less legally binding for healthcare providers. This holds specifically for the advanced on treatment directive, which was primarily meant as an instrument to refuse death-delaying treatments. However, in this connection, it is relevant to better understand in which specific clinical situation advanced directives have acquired meaning. And for this, we have to cross the ocean to the United States of America, the cradle of the living world and the advanced directive. Advanced directives were first introduced by a lawyer named Louis Cutter in 1996, but they gained in importance through several much debated court cases that dealt with decisions to forego life-sustaining treatments in patients in a persistent vegetative state, such as Karen Ann Quinlan and Nancy Cruzen. The idea of what influence advanced directives could have is clearly illustrated by the following quote from the Supreme Court dealing with the Quinlan case. We have no doubt, the court said, that in these unhappy circumstances, that if Karen were herself miraculously lucid for an interval and receptive of her irreversible condition, she could effectively decide upon discontinuance of the life support apparatus, even if it meant the prospect of natural death. So, the advanced directive is thought to represent the voice of the former healthy person who judges what has become of him. In, 1919, in 1990, the advanced directive received in the United States a formal legal status through the enactment of the Patient Cell Determination Act, and they were introduced without any practical guidance whatsoever in the rather naive belief that they would more or less automatically change medical culture and have a positive influence on decision-making at the end of life. However, this expectation did come true. And an important reason for this was the fact that the directive came most widely used by all the people with fears of dementia and related disorders. That is to say, disorders in which capacity is not acutely and completely lost, as in the case of a recent vegetative state. And already three years later, a group of end-of-life experts gathered in Squam Lake, New Hampshire, with task to review the Pain Self-Determination Act and to reflect on the pace of advanced directives in medical care during the end of life. And during this multidisciplinary conference, participants moved from the use of the term advanced directive to the more global term advanced care planning, a concept that was fraught explicitly in response to the inadequacies of advanced directives, to which I will return in a few moments. 
But first, what exactly are the inequities of advanced directives? And why are the documents not an optimal way to prepare for the future? I think all these problems have to do with fact that advanced directives are too simple a solution for a too complex a clinical existential issue. One of the problems of advanced directives is that they are seldom made in consultation with healthcare professionals. And when they are shared with a general practitioner, they are often added to the patient file without much discussion or explanation. As a consequence, the content of advanced directives is frequently unclear, with standard formula like the wish for a dignified death, or rejection of an unworthy life, or a life as a greenhouse plant. Also, their relevance for the author himself regularly remains uncertain, and research has shown that authors frequently give leeway to their children to deviate from their advanced directives. But I think the most serious issue regarding the validity of advanced directives resides in the fact that these documents are static, whereas people's preferences are not. Studies on the stability of preferences have demonstrated that our anticipatory beliefs often fail to recognize our ability to adapt. And in general, one can say that preferences are probably most stable in patients in a stable health condition, uh, though an advanced directive seems perhaps most applicable in cases of acute, acute severe illness or trauma. Unstable health, on the other hand, will lead to changing preferences. And it's a relevant research finding that people suffering from chronic disorders adapt to the changing health condition and adjust their preferences accordingly. So patients' preferences for future care cannot be established once and for all, but need to be reassessed on a regular basis. And dementia is no exception here. Indeed, vulnerable people tend to change their mind, particularly when their minds have changed. And the following quotes from one of our interview studies with patients recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease are illustrative in this respect. Here's a person with Alzheimer's disease who says, oh, I think, think, experience it myself that in fact, uh, well, you look at it from a distance, then you dread it. But once you are faced with it, it's not too bad. And this person also diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, who was also in the possession of an advanced directive, says, I think, I think, experienced myself that I, in fact, well, when you look at it, oh, it's the wrong quote. It contains a whole story, he says, about me not really wanting to go through with this, you know, and that I would then, yeah, to get an injection. Well, I think it's still a little premature because I feel quite good. I think this is what complicates preference adaptation in dementia, and that's a huge challenge for all of us. As with other chronic diseases, psychosocial factors play an important role in the way people with dementia deal with the consequences of their illness and their diagnosis. But dementia also involves a progressive change in awareness of self and of mental problems related to dementia. So we must realize that these adaptive responses occur in a situation of a progressive neurodegenerative process and is paralleled by a gradual decrease in decision-making ability. But in contrast to patients in a persistent vegetative state, people with dementia, notwithstanding their decision-making disabilities, remain actively involved in their situation and will express wishes and preferences up and until the more advanced stages of their illness. Hence the ongoing and seemingly undecidable debate in ethical theory concerning the question whose wishes deserve our respect, those laid down by the then self or former person in an advanced directive, or those uttered by the demented now self or current person 
who has forgotten all about his advance directive. Now, a proposed way out of the dilemma dynamics created by advanced directives is advanced care planning. As said, this concept was designed in 1993 at the Scrum Lake Conference. Discussion here is often briefly summarized as they, those participants, went in with advanced directives and came out with advanced care planning, defined as a process of communication of patients, their health care providers, their families, and important others regarding the kind of care that will be considered appropriate when the patient cannot make decisions. Advanced care planning thus implies a shift away from static documents to a dynamic process of communication and can be considered an important element of quality end of life care because, according to Martin Emanuel and Singer, the, epi the epidemiology of dying has shifted nowadays from sudden death to slow deterioration. It is important, however, to underscore and to repeat that advanced directives and advanced care planning are really truly distinct concepts because in the literature and in practice, these terms are frequently conflated and used as interchangeable terms. Also, perhaps because of the strong legal status of advanced non-treatment directives, it is often thought that advanced care planning is supposed to result in the drafting of an advanced directive, which is not true. Another misconception is that advanced care planning should consist in eliciting and documenting specific treatment instructions, such as do not, do not resuscitate or do not hospitalize. In contrast to these misconceptions, a key element of advanced care planning is that advanced care plans are reviewed on a regular basis and are open for future adjustments. And precisely by my maintaining dialogue with each other and by regularly revising plans, it may perhaps very well be possible to prevent a future conflict between the preferences of the now self and the former then self. And then we might perhaps conclude that this ethical conflict between now and then is more or less an artifact of the advanced directives. A second core element of advanced care planning, implicitly indicated in the Squam Lake definition where it speaks of appropriate care, is the importance of care goals. And in this connection, the recent International Delphi panel more explicitly states that the goal of advanced care planning is to help ensure that people receive medical care that is consistent with their values, goals, and preferences during serious and chronic illness. In practice, however, it is not always clear how goals are defined and served, and notwithstanding the above-mentioned consensus definition, there is considerable heterogeneity in the envisioned outcome of advanced care planning. An analysis of my group of the literature on advanced care planning identified five distinctive underlying care goals of advanced care planning, and each with, its equally, uh, each with its own equally to consider limitation or objection. And here you see those five underlying goals. First goal might be uh, respecting individual patient autonomy. Advanced care planning originally extends, it, it aims to extend patient autonomy to stages of decisional incapacity. But this goal might promise more control than is possible and underestimates the effects of response shift and preference adaptation, especially in patients with decision-making disability. The second goal can be improving quality of care at the end of life. Advanced care planning is a means to tailor care to patient needs, but the risk here is that providers of palliative care might regard advanced care planning as a moral imperative for patients. Third important goal can be strengthening of relationships. Through discussions about preferences for future care, family and healthcare professionals enhance a commitment to the patients with here as potential risk that others take over too early. Fourth goal is preparing for the end of life. 
With this goal, advanced care planning is a means to come to terms with end of life. But the objection against this goal can be that it holds the risk that advanced care planning is regarded as a panacea for end of life care. And finally, the fifth goal can be prevention of overtreatment and crisis decision making. The essence here is that knowing what lies ahead is helpful to prepare for the future and helps define futile treatments. However, the risk here is that advanced care planning is regarded as an instrument to limit treatments and works out as a pressure in patients to refuse treatments. I think all of these five goals are relevant for advanced care planning in people with dementia. And it is important to address them explicitly and also to be sensitive to possible risks and objections and to discuss them openly with those involved where possible. And above all, advanced care planning is not a must. If people with dementia want to live one day at a time, that is also their right. But it should not be a prior assumption of care providers allowing them to avoid any discussion about future care. So in summary and synthesizing the above mentioned goals, advanced care planning in dementia entails a dialogical process of supporting patients and their proxies to think ahead as they confront the challenge of a progressive illness trajectory. As a process, it should start early, allow for more participants, calls for an active role of the physician, and is best done step by step. Don't plan too far ahead. And it may serve multiple goals to be addressed explicitly by the physician. To finalize, I gave you these topics for reflection and discussion. One, delay in diagnosis may have an active participation of people with dementia in advanced care planning. So advanced care planning in dementia calls for a proactive role of the general physician. Three, drafting an advanced directive and presenting an advanced directive to the GP cannot be the end, but must be the start of advanced care planning. Four, addressing the issue of preference adaptation and the consequences thereof is an essential element of advanced care plan discussions with people with dementia. And finally, early involvement of proxies in advanced care planning is relevant in order to strengthen relationships and to improve the quality of future substitute decision-making. That's what I have to say to you. Thank you for your attention. Yes, yes. no, I don't. Thank you very much, <laughs> Case, for your wonderful presentation. Also thought-provoking, just like the presentation of Carlos. And I've seen that there are some questions in the uh, chat, so I will relate them to you. But first, I thought an important thing that you said in the last few sentences was that we have all kind of prior assumptions as doctors and also as patients, I assume, but and that we should make sure that we verify those assumptions and not act on them. I think that's also an important message. But now I'm going over to the questions. Just a moment. Uh, there is a question from Rob Dijkstra from the Netherlands, who says, um, how to deal with relatives who do not follow preference adaptation and say, my mother was always very clear that she did not want the situation. And you did very clearly explain preference adaptation. So how to deal with the relatives that don't follow the preference adaptation case? Yes, um, I recognize the situation because my mother had the same uh, preference before she became demented. So uh, I think the important message uh, is that we evolve relative as early as possible in talks about the future uh, and that we uh, in that first conversation uh, already try to address 
the problem of the fact that our anticipatory beliefs are different from our adaptive processes. Uh, and I think that's the only way to accompany relatives uh, in this trajectory that we have to go uh, together and that they have to go together with their dear one. Uh, and I think the fact that we infrequently do so is one of the reasons why parties uh, split. Uh, and I think that is particularly the problem of advanced directives. Uh, when people draft an advanced directive, they discuss it with their dear ones. They say, I don't want to go to a nursing home. And that's it. Mm -hmm. And there the conversation stops and everyone lives his life until the crucial decision is done. And then children uh, are threatened by what they promised their parents. And the talks have been absent uh, in the period between the drafting of the advanced directive and the development of cognitive impairment. Mm. So that's really the problem that there's no conversation going on. There's no ongoing conversation. And, well, we all say that we uh, conduct advanced care planning discussions, but if we look into ourselves, I think, well, we can do better. Okay. Might it... I think, I think uh, the relevance of advanced care planning and the documentation by the GP of advanced care plan discussions in his file is also relevant for the next doctor. Mm -hmm. Because if the patient, at least in the Netherlands, moves to a nursing home, there is another doctor who has to take over. And in my experience as a nursing home doctor, it frequently happens that there has never been a discussion about the meaning of the advanced care plan, uh, the, the, the meaning of the advanced directive, the limitation of the advanced directive. And what has been promised really by the general physician, because the ritual of handing over the advanced directive to the doctor and the reply of the doctor between brackets by receiving the advanced directive is in interpreted by many patients in terms of he will help me. Okay, yeah. Okay, maybe it relates a little bit on another question that has been put in the question and the answer section from Hans van der Wouden. And he says, results of the positive effects of AP, advanced care planning for appropriate medical care and quality of life are not overwhelming. Should we reconsider advanced care planning? Um, I think my answer would be we should improve advanced care planning. And a lot of what we do, and that is termed advanced care planning, in my view, is not advanced care planning. It's only advanced directives or something no it's we, we also the latest covid crisis mm -hmm. uh, and the talks we had with our older persons about not going to, not going to the hospital and not going to the intensive care was labeled by any as a good example of advanced care planning it is not in my view advanced care planning is only saying what we are not going to do but it's not a positive plan in terms of what we are going to do instead Mm -hmm. So advanced care planning, by signing away certain treatments, is only halfway. The next step is to make an alternative plan. What are we going to do instead? And this is what we have to evaluate. Okay. But that's not an answer, a complete answer, Tom. Oh. But I can discuss further with it. Discuss <laughs> on, I suppose, yes. And then one last remark or question from Toosje Falkenberg, also from the Netherlands. When the patient cannot make decisions is a highly discutable moment. It seems that patients with dementia are quite well capable to express themselves in the moment. The problem is that they can't reflect on the data. Shouldn't it be, should start early and should be continued during life? Could you read the last? Shouldn't it be, should start early, I think it means the ACP, yeah. and um, continue throughout life. I think that. Well, I, I, I can uh, only uh, agree with that. Uh, another issue is, of course, that to do proper conversations with people with decision making uh, disability, we have to know more about their cognitive profile and uh, about their cognitive strengths 
in order to involve them uh, uh, in the best way in our conversations. Mm-hmm. And that's a new development in discussion on, on uh, decisional capacity. We do a capacity assessments, uh, assessments most of the time to exclude patients from being involved in the decision and to resort to substitute decision making. I would say let's do it the other way around. Turn around. Do yeah. capacity assessment to learn how we can include the person with decision making disability in conversations about treatment decisions and advanced care plans. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have no time left. There are some more questions in the chat, but I can also invite people to uh, participate in the round table. And maybe Harris, you conclude the presentation now. I would like to thank both our speakers, Carlos and Case, for this thought provoking uh, presentations. And um, a big thanks also to you, Henriette and Ref, for uh, the moderation of the discussion. Um, and I would like to invite all of our colleagues to the next round table on ethical aspects of uh, the elderly that will take place in just half an hour from now. Uh, it will be moderated by Henriette and by Dimitri Pont, as uh, is the uh, chair of the Special Interest Group on Aging and Health of Onca. Um, and our uh, speakers will be available to discuss their own. Thank you all for participating uh, in this uh, session, and I wish you a very good uh, continuation of the conference. Uh, thank Goodbye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.